are these people? So, uh, so again, this first segment, uh, this is about the Rwanda genocide. So as I said earlier, starting on Sunday, uh, the country of Rwanda is doing a 100-day remembrance uh, in recognition of the Rwandan genocide that took place 30 years ago. Um, so because it lasted 100 days, they do a remembrance basically for the next 100 days. So we'll go all the way through July. Um, mm. So as I said earlier, I did an interview with one of my close friends and mentors, uh, Ronnie Kadala, who lives in Kigali, uh, the capital. Um, and we talked about the Rwandan genocide there. So that was an interview I did with him nearly three years ago. So mm. if you want to check that out, uh, you can go in our playlist and, and you, you can find it. In you the traveled group. there, right? How long ago I went that? there. In 2019, I went there en route to Uganda. So I mm. met him in Uganda uh back in 2011 and he, since i since then he moved back home to rwanda mm. and then when i went the last time i went to africa uh i contacted him and he's like well you know what if you're gonna go to U uganda why don't you spend a few days with me in kigali so i spent three days with him and his family in kigali and actually he took me uh, to the memorial, uh, so they so in Kigali they have a huge memorial um, site in remembrance of. So he took me to that, and then a couple of things that were pertinent to the genocide, um, mm. you know, while I was there. So, um, so again, this is something that people, as I said, I kind of knew about it growing up. I kind of vaguely remember hearing about it on the news, but not a whole whole lot. So I would argue that this genocide kind of, at least in the West, kind of went under the radar. So what I want to do is just to give you guys some context, um, I want to play this clip, this TED Talk clip that talks a little bit about the genocide. And then we're going to look at an article that kind of fills in some of the details that, um, that the TED Talk does not mention. And then we are going to talk about, given obviously there are some parallels you can immediately think of in terms of Gaza, how Israel <laughs> currently is involved in this. He so, uh, which is, um, what's that? He doing its nonsense. Well, you can kind of argue <laughs> the capacity, but you will understand yes. more of that uh, yep. when we get to it. So let's play this clip first. Uh, you can play the whole thing. More about For 100 days in 1994, the African country of Rwanda suffered a horrific campaign of mass murder. Neighbor turned against neighbor as violence engulfed the region, resulting in the deaths of over one-tenth of the country's population. The seeds of this conflict were planted a century earlier, first when German and later Belgian colonizers arrived in the country. At the time, Rwanda was ruled by a monarchy of Tutsi, one of the three ethnic groups comprising the population. Tutsi and the even smaller Twa communities were minority groups, while Hutu composed the majority. Many Hutu and Tutsi civilians were on good terms, but colonial powers encouraged political division. Belgians enforced record-keeping around ethnic identity and created a public narrative that cast Tutsi as elite rulers and Hutu as ordinary farmers. Over time, this propaganda led to intense political hostility. And while colonial powers had largely withdrawn by 1959, lingering anger motivated a Hutu revolt, forcing many Tutsi leaders to flee the country. Over the following decade, Rwanda transitioned to an independent republic with the Hutu government. This new administration argued that as the majority group, Hutu deserved exclusive access to political power. They excluded the Tutsi minority by appointing offices based on population and prohibited the return of Tutsi families that had fled years earlier. Hutu extremists also circulated propaganda, blaming Tutsi for the country's economic, social, and political problems. Discontent with their life in exile, a small group of Tutsi insurgents invaded Rwanda in 1990, beginning a violent civil war. The conflict lasted three years before it was resolved 
with a formal peace accord. But the war's aftermath was rife with insecurity. While some civilians in both groups remained amicable, the treaty intensified political polarization. And in 1994, when a plane carrying the Hutu Rwandan president was shot down, the conflict broke out anew. This time, Hutu officials had prepared a deadly response to ensure they stayed in power. Working off a list of targets, government-funded Hutu militias flooded the streets, perpetrating acts of physical and sexual violence against Tutsi political enemies and civilians. Over the chaotic following months, over one million Hutu civilians joined their ranks due to coercion, self-preservation, or the pursuit of personal agendas. Tutsi victims sought refuge at churches and schools where they hoped international organizations would protect them. But no outside party came to their aid. UN soldiers who'd overseen the peace accord were instructed to abandon Tutsi civilians, and UN leadership refused to acknowledge the genocide taking place. The violence didn't end until mid-July, when the Tutsi army, who instigated the previous civil war, seized control of the country. By the time the fighting was over, roughly 800,000 Rwandans had been killed, and only a small fraction of the Tutsi population was left alive. In the months that followed, there was no easy strategy for bringing the killers to justice. The UN established a special tribunal in Tanzania to try the key perpetrators. But Hutu civilians from every level of society had committed atrocities against their neighbors, friends, and even family members. There were roughly 120,000 Rwandans awaiting trial, and inmates were dying from overcrowding and poor hygiene. The new Rwandan government estimated it would take 100 years to prosecute every accused civilian in national court. So officials determined the best path forward involved looking to the country's past. Rwanda has a traditional process for resolving interpersonal conflicts called Kachacha, roughly translating to justice on the grass. Kachacha had long been used to address offenses within villages. Local witnesses would offer testimony and could then speak for or against the accused. Then, appointed lay judges would determine an appropriate penalty within the community's means. In the hope of trying perpetrators more quickly, the government adapted Kachacha for their formal courts. These hybrid trials had no professional attorneys or judges and no evidence outside the spoken word and a case file detailing the crimes of the accused. All charges were then divided into four categories. Masterminding the genocide and committing acts of sexual violence, participating in the killings, physical assault, or destroying Tutsi property. Those found guilty of the first two categories were entered into the traditional court system. But the other crimes were assigned set penalties, which could be reduced if the accused pled guilty. Beginning in 2002, thousands of gachacha courts convened every week. The process proved faster than conventional courts, but Rwandan opinion on the trials was mixed. Some didn't want to accuse their neighbors in a community setting, and many potential witnesses were intimidated to prevent their testimony. Additionally, while the trials showed that not all Hutu participated in the killings, the courts only reviewed cases with Tutsi victims, ignoring the Hutu casualties incurred during the genocide and the preceding civil war. When the trials concluded in 2012, the courts had convicted 1.7 million individuals. For some families, these verdicts helped restore the dignity of those lost in the violence. For others, the trials were a decade-long reminder of a past they were desperate to leave behind. The legacy of colonialism has affected Africa in innumerable ways. Learn how Thomas Sankara, nicknamed Africa's Che Guevara, campaigned to heal his country, Burkina Faso, from the wounds of its colonial past. Well, <clears throat> okay. Um, so, def definitely some parallels. Yeah. Uh, so, still a bit confusing. I'm sure. I'm sure we'll go into some detail. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that was a little much. But basically, what you have to know is that the Belgians drove a wedge between the Hutus and the Tutsis. And and you could probably guess why. Yeah. <laughs> and the article that I bring from Vox, actually if you pull that up, um, will actually kind of clarify a lot of that uh, and kind of give I'm, some more context to a lot I'm of this. I'm betting natural resources are part of this. 
If I were to guess. Yeah. Okay. Yes. In part. Yeah. Um, so this is from Vox. Uh, this is written by Zach Bochamp. I think we've read other articles from him before. Sure. His name sounds familiar. Um, but he, oh, so by the way, he wrote this 10 years ago, by the way. Yeah. Um, so Rwanda's genocide, what happened, why it happened, and how it still matters. We're not going to read all of it, but just <clears throat> a lot of the bits, uh, just to clarify a lot of the information that was in that TED talk. Um, so the story behind the Rwandan genocide begins with colonialism. The split between Hutus and Tutsis arose not as a result of religious and cultural differences, but economic ones. Mm -hmm. Hutus were people who farmed crops, while Tutsis were people who tended livestock. Most Rwandans are Hutus. So, give some context. In East Africa, cows are a source of wealth. Yeah. So, so if you have lots of cows... Um, you are, you are cons even today you are considered wealthy. This is why, actually, in a lot of marriages now, still, yeah. uh, a cows traditional marriage, yeah, you give a cow or a mm. couple as part of the wife's. Dowry. Well, like just meat, right? Like I've seen that as a thing too, where it's like, <laughs> oh yeah, but just, um, like lots of meat. Like here you go, here's meat, a lot of beef. But then like meat grazing. Um, especially like you have a lot of land, you're able to graze it if you have at least one, but like if you have several, you can graze land. Uh, to, you can obviously with that grow a lot of crops. So, so cows are a source of economic, um, value in East mm. Africa in particular. So that's the context because you probably like why cows, but cows are a source of wealth. Sure. Uh, gradually, these class divisions became seen as ethnic designations. So ba basically, class system. Um, yes. Um, class system. Basically, yes. Okay. Because cattle were more valuable than crops, the minority Tutsis became the local elite. By the time Belgium took over the land in 1917 from Germany, who took it in 1884, an ethnic Tutsi elite had been the ruling monarchy for quite some time. Hmm. German and Belgian rule made the dividing lines between the groups sharper. This divide-and-conquer strategy meant supporting the Tutsi monarchy and requiring all local chiefs be Tutsis, turning the Tutsis into symbols of colonial rule for the Hutu majority. Post-independence, the resentment created by colonial divide-and-conquer bred violence. Seeing as Hutus were a large majority, they handily won the country's first elections in 1961, and the regime that followed was staunchly Hutu nationalist. Intermittent violence between Hutus and Tutsis became a feature of post-independent Rwanda. The Rwandan genocide was a different class of violence altogether from what came before it. It wasn't just wartime violence, it was a directed, premeditated attempt to eliminate an entire people. The Hutu government had fought a war with Ugandan-based Tutsi rebels, the, the Rwandan Patriotic Front, or IPF, from 1990 to 1993. By early 94, at the latest, many Hutus, including a number of important government officials, had come to the conclusion that the real problem was to Rwanda's Tutsi minority. They began organizing armed parliamentary gangs and training them to prepare to white out Tutsi civilians. Mm. President Habrat, oh boy, I'm going to butcher this name, so I'm sorry. President Habriarimana had agreed to a United Nations enforced peace agreement with the RPF. The missile that shot down Haji Ramara, uh, Mana's plane shattered that agreement. We still do not know today whether Tutsi rebels or Hutu extremists opposed to the peace agreement fired the missile, but it quickly became irrelevant. The Hutu ethnic supremacists saw a green light to begin their extermination campaign. On April 7th, hence the, be the killing began. Hutu militias, mostly infamously the government backed inter Hamawe, went city to city and village to village, slaughtering Tutsis with guns and machines. The militias were hor 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 horrifyingly efficient, 
using a radio station to coordinate the beginnings of the campaign around the country and to tell people where the graves were not quite full yet. Okay. They were killing at a pace of about 8,000 Tutsis per day. And these are <coughs> Tutsis are the cow people, right? Mm -hmm. And then so at some point power shifted <laughs> to the, the farm people, the Hutus. Okay. Gotcha. And now they're coming, they're coming <laughs> back at the Tutsis, essentially, for, Basically. you know, right. ruling over them. Basically. Gotcha. Caused by, so, and you can argue that the Belgians and the Germans, like, aren't the fast forwarded that. that. Right, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Unlike earlier mass killings, such as the Holocaust, the international community had advanced evidence of the coming genocide. Once it launched, they had the evidence of where it was going and still did nothing. Canadian General Ramon Romeo Delare, who commanded the small UN observer force tasked with implementing the peace agreement, heard the Hutus were planning genocide in January 1994. He informed the higher-ups at the UN, but wasn't permitted to act. Even after the genocide began, the evidence of slaughter became undeniable. The international community did nothing. The United States actively discouraged the UN Security Council from authorizing a more robust deployment. So basically, the UN did shit. Yeah, as it tends to. So... In hindsight, there's a good chance the UN could have done something. General Delare believes that with an extra 5,000 troops and a stronger UN mandate, he could have saved hundreds of thousands. The failure to intervene, which Bill Clinton calls one of the greatest regrets of his pres presidency, and that's oh, saying it lately, yeah. catalyzed a modern movement in favor of humanitarian military intervention to prevent genocide. Two major Obama administration officials, Susan Rice and Samantha Power, came converted to the cause of humanitarian intervention in part due to America's inaction in Rwanda. And Fun fact with Susan Rice, which is why I call her one of the biggest cowards yes. in in government, she, at least. She when got her mind her. right. Right. Well, she got her mind right because she also knew about it. But the argument that she has made, I think, kind of publicly was that she was an intern. Um, so she didn't know, like, the protocol of what to do, allegedly. Mm -hmm. But my thing is, even if you are an intern and if you are aware of genocide, you yeah. can be doing do something. whatever you can to, you know, say like something. Who, but, like the people who quit their jobs recently. Right. You know? so, so, yeah. But because it was in Africa, she yeah, can Yeah, no be one modern. cares. Right. So, of course. Um, the day after the genocide began, the Tutsi rebel group RPF, led by Paul Kagame, who is now president, launched yep. an, offens an offensive aimed at toppling the Rwandan government. In about 100 days, the RPF defeated the government forces. Kagame, a Tutsi, became the country's leader in all but name. A Hutu was technically made president while Kagame was vice president, but Kagame controlled the army. Though the RPF stopped the genocide from reaching its completion, the victory was hardly clean. A Human Rights Watch assessment of the campaign concluded that systematic RPF killings claimed tens of thousands of Hutu lives. These revenge killings by oppressed are sadly common after episodes of mass killing, and one reason why the lack of international peacekeeping forces can be so devastating. Moreover, the aftershocks of the Rwandan genocide contributed to the conflict in the Congo. That war, the deadliest since World War II, was sparked in part by two million Hutus fleeing Rwanda attacking Tutsis. Some of the two million were militiamen who attacked Tutsis in the Congo. The Kagame government supported local Tutsi forces, and the conflict escalated. Today, Kagame still runs for Uganda. He's officially been president since 2000. His record has been extraordinarily mixed. He's done an incredible job helping rebuild life in Rwanda since the genocide, but he's also sponsored violence around the region, killed political descendants, and consolidated authoritarian power. Mm -hmm. Start with the good. 
Rwanda's life expectancy has doubled in the past decade, and child mortality and HIV rates have plummeted. The Rwandan economy has grown at a staggeringly high 8% rate since 2008, making it by one investment the most desirable African country to invest in. And being in Kigali, it's, yes, yeah. I can tell you, it's beautiful. Did and I mean, monies? well, they got some monies, but um, I forgot what, is, what the uh, Kia Rwandan name is, but every one Saturday a month, the entire country, no matter where you live, spends two hours, a, f a few hours every, like, Saturday, well, one Saturday a month, to essentially clean the neighborhood of where they live. So any trash, like, oh, yeah. make sure everything is pristine. Like, they take... Hair shit? Like, yeah, seriously. And, like, you know, like, if you were to visit... Like, I would say, if you were to visit Africa and you're not sure where to go, I would say Rwanda, because I think it's a, I almost kind of like the gateway country in terms of like, you know, there's still some Western sensibilities, but it's a lot cleaner and it's a lot more, less chaotic mm -hmm. compared to like other African cities, like East African cities, uh, that it's easier to navigate. So... Gotcha. Um, but again, I would also make the argument too that a lot of that wealth is coming from the West. So, and and I apologize to all my Wandan friends who love Kagame, but you also know how I feel about him. I'm very mixed on him. He I he reminds me very, and he kind of looks like Obama too. Like I think he has one foot in terms of African priorities, but another foot. In Western parties, where mm. where he where he feels he's able to take advantage of it, or is, kind of be complicit in some things in regards to the West. Where where does Wakanda sit in all this? How do they? <laughs> what are they doing? Where's Black Panther uh, at? Um, like, okay. Um, However, Kagame's government is described by his critics as an ethnic autocracy. Tutsis to make up 10% of the government staff, most official positions, especially in the military. Kagame has supported mur murderous foreign militias like the M23 in the Congo and may have been complicit in revenge killing. Perhaps most ominously, a statistical assessment of the risk of state-led mass killings, mass killing put Rwanda in the top 15% of countries most likely to see mass killing. I'm sure that's stated again. This Articles were written a decade ago, so I'm sure that's yeah. probably changed since then. Sadly, there's no reason to stop worrying about Rwanda even 20 years from the time of this writing, after the genocide. Mm. So, <clears throat> so, kind of giving a little bit more, so hopefully that kind of filled in a little more gaps for you in terms of um, you're kind of making it look because it is a little bit confusing in terms of who did what and why. So hopefully that kind of and yeah, when. So hopefully that kind of filled in. Help. Yeah. So yeah. So hopefully that kind of filled in. Well, and it's also for you. multiple countries involved, right? It's more than just Rwanda in it. It's the Congo who was housing Tutsis who then retaliated. Right. You know, like putting um, Kagame in power. Right. Like, and then, okay. you know, Europe being involved, like Belgium, Germany, France. Yeah. And the just US, turning a blind eye to. Turning a blind eye. Genocide. If anything, pulling, pulling UN forces out, mm. you know, because God forbid anyone in the West gets killed. Gets hurt. Uh, right. So, you know, pulling forces out and allowing. The genocide to continue and basically not declaring it a genocide until after the fact. So, uh, yeah. hence Clinton's comment that regrettable, and as I said, that's a very generous word to try to describe that. Um, so, fast forward till today. Um, so, we're going to check out this clip from Al Jazeera. It's talking about, you know, Rwanda. You know, again, this is their 30th anniversary of this event. 
We're not going to watch all of it, but obviously, as you said, and I'm sure our audience is very smart, making a lot of parallels between that and what's happening in Gaza now. So uh, I, the thing is, I forgot to time this. So we don't need to watch the whole thing, but we can at least play it from the beginning and we mm -hmm. can kind of stop where mm -hmm. they start talking about Gaza, at least the connection there. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so here we go. Africa has highlighted the Rwanda genocide during its case against Israel at the International Court of Justice. It says the international community failed to prevent the atrocities from being committed back in 1994 and warns history should not be repeated. Victoria Gatenby reports. The genocide in Rwanda unfolded in full view of the world. <coughs> Belgian peacekeepers were tortured and murdered on the first day of the killings. An appeal for reinforcements was denied, and as the number of those killed increased, the United Nations Security Council condemned the massacres, but refused on the insistence of the US and the UK to use the term genocide. The US President Bill Clinton admitted regret on, when he Steve. visited Rwanda in 1998. Damn. We did not act quickly enough after the killing. I did not began. act quickly we enough. We should not have allowed the refugee camps to become safe havens. I was with Monica at the time. We did not immediately call these crimes by their rightful name, genocide. Mm. A report published by Rwanda in 2021 found France bore a significant responsibility for not stopping the massacres, despite prior knowledge they were being planned. Some estimates put the number of dead at around 800,000. France was accused of covering up its role and even protecting some perpetrators. A French inquiry blamed the government for not foreseeing the slaughter and said it bore a serious and overwhelming responsibility, but it absolved the French government of direct complicity. Can we pause here for a the mm -hmm. So think about this, and I this was a story that we did want to talk about, but we cut it, regarding Rafa right now. You know, because mm. right again, this like yeah, got to learn your history, it. folks. You yep. know, like we know what well, at least BB is saying. We got a date to storm Rafa, right? Yep. And what are we doing? We're just kind of like, hey, don't, like I haven't heard I it. Like, I don't know what could happen. So, First to take trips right. out, then we put you right. back. And I don't know. And you notice what Bill Clinton said, as I said earlier, is the idea of like they were used to call it genocide until close to a million black people were already dead. Then it was okay, okay. to say it. And right now, okay, you know, 30, and right 40, now, 50,000 right. Palestinians like are basically dead and they still having trouble mm -hmm. in saying the G word. So, yeah. So, so my question is, how many more people does yeah, it have to the take line? before you actually, yeah. right? Yeah. Like a hundred thousand, two hundred, because mm. it's going to head there probably depending in the next few weeks or months, depending when BB plans his assault um, in Rafa. Um, but anyway, let's continue. Those who stalked the swamps, the hills, the churches. <laughs> did not have the face of France. France was not an accomplice. No, South we never, Africa we didn't do anything. A case against Israel at the International was Court it me? of Justice, accusing it of carrying out genocide in Gaza and says history should not be repeated. Rwanda stands out as a stem and severe rebuke to all of us for having failed, to, for, for the international community having failed to prevent it from happening. Let us not have it live with the same regret when it comes to Palestine. The International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, based in Tanzania, convicted 61 people for their role in the killings. Hundreds of thousands more have faced trial in community courts in Rwanda. 30 years on, many see the failings that what led to that genocide for? as a timely lesson and one that's never really? seen more relevant. Victoria Gatenby, Al Jazeera.
Well, Charles Petrie is former Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations and United Nations Deputy Coordinator in Rwanda during the 1994 genocide. He joins us now from Amman. Good to have you with us. You arrived, Mr. Petrie, in Rwanda about a month into the genocide. Tell us about your role there and the particular challenges you faced there as a UN representative. Yes, th thank you for having me. Yeah, no, I arrived, you're right, um, in May, early May, uh, 94, uh, a month into the genocide. About half of the, the people who were to, to be murdered were, were killed. Um, I, as the deputy humanitarian coordinator, my responsibility was to try and get a better sense of what was happening on the ground, reporting it to New York, and then also facilitating um, uh, the activities of the different humanitarian partners. The first was actually quite challenging because they, you know, we, we talk about the failure of the Security Council in Rwanda. I mean, one has to remember that, that the, the Security Council was addressing the, the, the genocide in Rwanda barely four weeks after the withdrawal of troops from Somalia. Mm. For me, the failure of Rwanda has paid paid the price for the failure of Somalia, of the international operation in Somalia, and that that really came to a head with the, the battle in Mogadishu early October, when the U.S. the U.S. Uh, special forces lost, I think, up to 20, 20 of their men, and the U.S. and other international and other countries decided that uh, they, they they weren't going to get involved in something that did not have a direct relevance to, to national interests. So you say that the UN Security Council deliberately failed Rwanda. Do you think that the same thing is happening today when we look at Gaza, that the UN Security Council today is deliberately failing people there too? Uh, well, I, I would say that Rwanda set the trend for what we've mm. been seeing ever since. Uh, I, I think, I mean, Somalia was was really the first post Cold War intervention, and there was an attempt to try and and sort of establish almost, I mean, it's, yeah, it's pretentious to say, but almost a new world order, at least to get involved in in promoting some of the basic the, the basic values. And, and it a failed. new world and order. As a result of the failure, I think the, the will of the international community to get involved in something more than direct national interest just dissipated. So the, the, the man that uh, our correspondent was talking to just then said that the world has not learned from the lessons of Rwanda. Would you agree with that? Well, I think the world has become uh, almost Darwinian. So it's not a question of not learning. It's, it's a question of the forces that are that are confronting each other. It's just what this new world order looks like. And it makes it exceedingly difficult to sort of push through basic principles in, in such a context. When we talk about progress happening in... So he didn't even answer the question, really. <laughs> it's just no. like, like, he was, like, she asked, basically, like... Is the ICJ doing the same thing? And he's like, nye, nye, nye. like, like, yeah. Well, and, and so, we'll talk about this, and I'm sure we'll talk about this in our our segment later too. It's, ICJ amounts to essentially a strongly worded letter right now, unless they can get the U.S. to do something, you know, right? Like, which it can just decide not to and ignore all of it. So, right. uh, you know, it's nice. That the, you know, they've said it's plausible. They've kicked the can down the road for a while on that. They supposedly gave Israel a month to get their crap together. That hasn't happened. Yeah. So, uh, is it, like, is it a genocide or not? ICJ still hasn't ruled yet. So it's plausible. So, we'll see. You know. Uh Speaking, in so Africa as I said earlier, the genocide. quiet. So, mm. so he, this is where the caucasity. Mm. Uh, oh God, Werner, Werner. Oh Isaac Herzog, not Werner. Yeah, Herzog. yeah. German. So this is the caucasity of it all. So irony as Herzog commemorates Rwanda genocide, as mm. Israel carries out. 
atrocities in Gaza. So Isaac Sarah, who's the Israeli president, flew to Rwanda to commemorate the genocide. Mm -hmm. While yes. Israel stands accused of similar crimes <laughs> in Gaza, where tens of thousands have been killed. Different so, German, yeah. Yes. Different German. Isaac, Isaac Herzog. Herzog. Ah, I see. Right. Oh. Isaac Herzog flew to Rwanda to commemorate the 1994 genocide. Yeah, we, we, we said that already. Yeah. Pro-Palestinian activists have pointed out the irony, I would say the caucasity of it, but whatever, of Israel's recent commemoration of the 1994 Rwanda genocide as Tel Aviv continues to indiscriminately kill and displace people in the Gaza Strip six months after the start of the war. Israeli President Isaac Sarag flew to the East African country on Sunday to participate in the ceremony remembering those who were killed in the massacres 30 years ago, as well as to advocate for the release of the remaining Israeli hostages held in Gaza, of course. No, of course. Did. Fucking dick in. Herzog's office said the president is expected to meet with dignitaries to discuss the hostages and to highlight the necess necessity to, joint, to the joint fight against terrorism worldwide, as cited by the Times of Israel. The Israeli head of state, who is on his first state visit to the African continent since the outbreak of the war in Gaza six months ago, also laid a wreath at the Rwandan Genocide Memorial in the capital, Kigali. Rwanda is currently commemorating 30 years since the harrowing events took place, where Hutu extremists targeted the Tutsi ethnic group, killing an estimated 800,000 to 1 million people in the space of 100 days. In a speech, President Carl Kagame blamed the international community's inaction for allowing the genocide to ha happen. However, pro-Palestinian activists have slammed Herzog and called out the irony of the visit as Israel continues to commit similar atrocities in the Gaza Strip, where at least 33,207 Palestinians, mostly women and children, have been killed. Author Michelle Pilnick called Herzog's visit obscene as he is a full participant and supporter of the Gaza genocide. Mm. Mark Seddon, a journalist and previous speechwriter to the former Secretary General of the United Nations, said, Unbelievably, President Sarad of Israel at a Rwanda genocide commemoration demonstrating that he does not comprehend the word irony. He thinks it's like rain on your wedding day. That's what he thinks irony. Right. You know, <laughs> like, okay. In December, South Africa accused Israel of committing a genocide against Gaza's Palestinians at the ICJ, which was followed by a hearing which ruled that Israel must do all it can to stop carrying out such acts against Palestinians. Additionally, others pointed out the irony of Israel having good ties with Rwanda's pre previous Hutu extremist government, which carried out the Tutsi genocide, as Israel mm. commemorated the horrific events. That was without Over conditions, the years, by the way. Was that? That was without conditions. It was like, right. get aid to people, uh, stop murdering Palestinians. Right. That was that was what it was. And Israel went, I don't care. So, you know. Over the years, various reports have emerged claiming that the Israeli government had provided military support to the Hutu-led regime during the Rwanda Civil War which oh, lasted fuck. from 1990 to 1994, and okay. continued to supply the group with arms as it carried so, the genocide. So they supported the genocide of people, is what you're telling me. Allegedly. Like, ag again. Allegedly. Again. I'm going to say allegedly because I don't want design to come after us, but allegedly, as, but we've Various reported reports have emerged. Reports of various African countries where somehow arms by Israel ended yeah. up in said countries. Galils. And, to, you know, sure. So, I mean, given the stories we've reported on in the last few months, I say allegedly, but I'm also kind of like, as of course there's they evidence, did. yeah. Right. Um, okay. Israel has remained tight-lipped over to the number of arms exports it made between 1990 and 1995. Mm. In 2016, the country's Supreme Court ruled that documents revealing such details would remain sealed, 
reported the Times of Israel, despite a request two years prior urging Israel's defense ministry to detail the nature of arms exports made during that period to the East African country. Israel and Rwanda share diplomatic relations. Israel and Rwanda share diplomatic relations with Tel Aviv opening an embassy in 2019, offering to boost the country in fields such as agriculture, cybersecurity, and health. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yep. Well, you notice these are the exact same fields that Israel is basically opening up in a lot of these African countries as well. Yeah, and Thailand and yes. Right. Many experts and NGOs say that Israel is carrying out a genocide in Gaza. Its indiscriminate airstrikes have left the territory in ruins, and scores of Palestinians are still being killed every day. Gaza's residents are also being deprived of basic needs such as food, water, and medicine by, medicine by Israeli siege. So, there you have it. Mm-hmm. So, so, overall, as the story goes, we haven't learned shit. And and I would make the argument, of course, and as I said, I don't think many people know about the Rwanda genocide, number one. But even just within the last half hour, 45 minutes, or however long this segment is going to be, you can already see the kind of parallels between this and Gaza, and basically the idea, like, you know, as we see in government, they don't care. They... Yeah. Say the thing that they need to say either just before or when it's too late and they do not take those lessons and apply it to future events. So we see what's happening right now in terms of how the U.S. and U.N. basically waited till after like the slaughter to declare a genocide even though they knew months ahead of time that this was going to happen. And we're heading into a similar shift right now with Israel, given that Bibi is already declaring an assault in, um, I forgot, I just blanked on the, um, Rafa? Rafa, the other thank place? You. Yeah. Um, and the UN has said nothing. The US has said nothing. You know, Germany has said nothing. And we're going to get to them later, you know, and, yeah, as we as I said earlier, how many people is it going to take to the like our leaders to kind of make the call like this is a genocide? Because again, we're already at at minimum forty thousand Palestinians. So, is it going to take a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand? Are we going to going to say it's going to take a million of them, like Rwandans, to kind of say? And that's the thing, and that's the idea. It's like it should not need to be, yeah. Like, survey we should not says... need to have that drastic of a number to declare a genocide. The intent is there, and you know, Israeli leaders have basically said yeah, as it's much. All, it's that they already want to think. wipe out. Also, we don't Palestine. need to call it a full-on genocide for us to clearly know that there's civilians dying by the hundred, like. We already know the data. Are you complicit in that, or are you not? Like, it's very easy to me. Like, so... So, shout out to my one and family. Um, we hope that this time, you know, obviously, this is a time of mourning and remembrance for you, so we stand in solidarity with you um, in terms of, we should try, I should probably try to have Ronnie back on at some point, um, yeah. maybe talk about something else, but you know, just <laughs> giving a little bit more insight sure. into you know, like the remembrance of what Rwandans are doing right now. But mm. you know, but obviously, like, and act, but obviously, given this, it's just kind of like you know, this this is almost situation by situation, exactly what's happening in Gaza now, and. And it's just showing that we people don't care. So that's the scary part. It's just people are not learning the lessons from previous tragedies to kind of move forward and be able to kind of step up and make the call to stop things before 
you know, it's too late and we're heading there already. So that's the scary part. Yep. Well, it's why, you know, not many people talk about this stuff because you tend to get demonetized when you do. So if you want to support us and get around that system, you can go to code.com slash introduce network, <coughs> QR code on your screen, or put exclam mark, exclamation mark donate in the live chat. Um, you know, very nice. But if you can't give that way, just like and subscribe. Hit the share button. That's easy. What else are you doing? You know? You can leave a comment while you're at it. Just, you know, what, two seconds. You could already be done by now. 